coming up on Garden Talk. My soil is the most important thing to me. If I don't have good soil, I don't have good crops. So I treat my soil extremely well and try to help it be as nutritious as possible. My tomato plant roots will feed on the microbes from the cover crop plantings that still, the roots are still in the ground. They may be dead, but there's, there's still life down there eating and surviving and helping each other out. So I'm a huge, huge cover crop fan. I'm building my soil legitimately every single year because I'm adding more castings, more soil milk, cover cropping. It, like it just gets better and the yields go up. And I mean, we know our mechanic, we know our doctor, we know the guy at Foot Locker that sells our shoes by name, but we don't know who put who grows the food that we put in our body and most of all our kids' body. That's just back ass words to me. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 99. In this episode, I interview Michael Bell. He runs a half-acre garden and supplies his local community with his harvests. He talks all about his garden, how he grows his plants, and how you can emulate what he does and make great money doing it. If you gain value from these podcast episodes, please click the like button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That way you can be notified when new episodes are released. If you'd like to support even more, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. There are various rewards set up for those that support, and you can pledge any amount that you'd like. 100% of the money pledged to Patreon goes right back into the podcast. It helps this podcast keep going, so thank you so much for your support there. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free gardening information of all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Their Grow 10 kits are incredible. You get their Ion Board LED grow light, their Grow Tent, which is currently the thickest on the market, their ventilation system, clip-on fan, and their Controller 69 to control it all. You also get their fabric pots, trellis net, plant ties, and trimmers. Definitely a good price for all that you get in the kit. I'll have a link in the description section below so you can learn more about these Grow Tank kits and the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. And we're back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Michael Bell. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So you have a very large garden and you actually grow plants for your local community and you make money while doing it. When you reached out to me and asked to be on the podcast, I was inspired. I commend you for what you're doing and for you wanting to come on and spread your message to inspire others. We're going to dive into the details of your garden and how you go about making money from it. But first, let's do an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, um, I own Dallas Half Acre Farm. It's a uh, little less than a half acre uh, piece of property right outside of Dallas, Texas. I don't live on the property. It's just strictly my farm and where I raise a few chickens and quail and, you know, it's a miniature farm is what I call it. Just a farm scaled down to a half acre. And I've been doing it seven years, <clears throat> starting in January will be my seventh year. And I grow seasonal vegetables for uh, families and people in my neighborhood and at businesses and that I know, you know, anyone that wants to buy, buy them, I'll sell them to them. I don't do farmer's markets. Um, it's directly, I don't do restaurants or grocery stores. It's directly to the families and the people that, that I know that want to buy. Um, so seasonal vegetables is like right now going into the fall here in Dallas winter. It's a uh, salad mix, kale, carrots, uh, small onions, um, you know, about the size of a quarter or a golf ball. And a lot of people eat them for the greens instead of the actual onions. So um, then I've got a uh, little bit of cilantro left and just anything that you think of during the winter, I grow that. And then come spring, I move into uh, salad. I, I grow salad year round here in Texas, so I can do that pretty easily. And then I do tomatoes, peppers, you know, a little bit of cantaloupe if I have the space. Just stuff that you think of in a seasonal garden. I just make it a little bit bigger and then I'm able to sell it. Okay. Pretty straightforward. And so you have different plants that you grow for different times of the year. Yep. Yep. It's, it's all seasonal. Um, like I don't grow carrots in the middle of the summer because it's, it's, they don't taste as good. 
Um, I don't grow tomatoes during the winter because obviously the frost and the freeze here in Texas kills them. So it's just basic what you would think of a backyard garden, except there's a few techniques I do to uh, increase my yield and um, overall profitability. So I imagine the folks that are looking to do this as well, determining a place to grow the plants. How do you determine if the space you are looking to plant in receives enough sunlight? Uh, it's just observation. Um, when I picked that, when I picked my property that I bought now, I went out there four or five times just to see where the sun was at different times of the day. Um, obviously, here in Texas, you know the summers are brutal. It's 110 for weeks, you know, between 100 and 110 for four to five, six weeks on end. So, in my context, I want uh, evening shade. So if I can get that morning sun up to three or four o'clock and then I've got a nice tree line or something off to the to the west to give me some shade that's perfect but yeah you are correct you need as much sunlight as possible for the growth but depending on your area you know if I'm in Minnesota I don't really care if I'm have a west shade or not because it doesn't get that hot there I just want maximum sunlight so you got to take in the context your your temperature and your amount of sunlight got it Talk to us a little bit deeper about your half acre that you're gardening on. I believe you're growing all in beds. Correct me if I'm wrong there. And then what plants do you have kind of growing where? So I grow, um, I grow, actually grow in three 130 foot long, 14 foot wide caterpillar tunnels. Um, they're seven foot six in the middle and they're shaped like a tunnel and they're, they're made out of uh, poles that are bent into a tunnel shape every five feet and it's got eight mil plastic on it and during the winter I can close everything down and hold in that heat um, during the summer I can raise the plastic up a good five or six feet on the side and then take the end walls down so I've got good airflow going every which direction so that allows me to plant summer crops earlier because in Texas we usually get a frost around Easter well I, I plant my tomatoes spring break so I plant them three to four weeks earlier than what I could as if I, if I didn't have my tunnels. And then in the fall, I just lost all my tomato plants last week because it got down to the low 30s, you know, for five or six hours a night, four nights in a row, and it just shocked them. Whereas last year, I had tomatoes selling at Christmas because we never got that cold. So some years I can have them for a long time. Some years, like this year, it was just kind of a freak deal with with getting that cold snap real early but it does you know growing in the tunnels helps tremendously it also protects them from the rain which you think you know plants don't need protection from the rain but when you're growing lettuce and even tomatoes what happens is in the summer here in texas you'll get a, a thunderstorm and it'll rain a quarter of an inch and an hour later it's 105 again and the humidity is 95 percent and it's pure hell on earth and those leaves on that lettuce are wet and it's 95 degrees, you get a fungus and you lose everything. Whereas growing under my tunnels, that plastic protects it. They don't get wet. Everything stays dry. And so it helps regard in regards to that quite a bit. So now that you understand the context of the tunnels, um, yes, I grow in raised beds about six to eight inches tall because my soil is so bad. It's literally clay. It's like concrete during the summer and swamp during the fall and the winter because it's so wet. So I just bought a bunch of one by six cedar boards and made beds that are three foot wide and 50 foot long inside my tunnels and gave me a little walkway every 50 foot to get in and out of the tunnels and filled them up with compost and my uh, amendments that I put in there, depending on what exact plant I'm putting in there with them. And off to go, um, I don't till. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of the phrase no-till. So I'm like, no-till, I never till my soil. Um, it helps with the fertility, and in Texas it gets so dry, it helps retain moisture. So that helps a ton, and um, it's just easier. My soil never gets compacted, I don't walk on my beds, so they never get compacted. Um, my beds are three foot wide, so I don't have to walk on my beds to, to harvest anything. I can get everything from one side 
and then I can walk around and do everything on the other side and reach to the middle when I go from both sides. So my soil, my soil is the most important thing to me. If I don't have good soil, I don't have good crops. So I treat my soil extremely well and try to help it be as nutritious as possible. I definitely want to get deeper into this soil and how you do the amending and, and so on and so forth. But I do want to ask about the tunnels first. Specifically, how much does it cost to build out those tunnels? There's a company, there's several companies. There's a, two main companies that you can get them from. One is Farmer's Friend, and it says farmersfriendllc.com. And then there's another uh, company called Bootstrap Farmer. And they both sell to small-scale farmers like, like me. And they just send you the kit. You put it together. They got a 10-minute video. Both of them have 10-minute videos on how to do it. Um, they're really easy to put together. I can put one up in about four hours by myself. I don't recommend it, but most of the shit that I do, I have to do by myself. <laughs> so um, it is possible. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't gotten a quote on a tunnel in a couple of years because I don't need any more. But I think a 50 footers around $1,200. So it's not going to break the bank, um, but it's definitely something you should be serious about before you go spend the money. But they do last an extremely long time. Like I've had the same plastic now going on seven seasons. I'll probably have to replace it after this season, but it's paid for itself very, very easily. Yeah, it sounds like it can be extremely valuable and pretty much needed for somebody like you where you have those swings in the environment like you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, that's a, Everyone that I talk to about this, I ask them, are you serious or you just want to try it? And if they say, I just want to try it out, I say, okay, wait till spring, you know, try it for three or four months. And then if you love it, spend the money and buy you a tunnel. But if you're dead serious right now, spend your money on a tunnel first and then, you know, buy the other stuff that you think you need because you just can't grow year round without the tunnels. And if you're trying to make money doing this, you can't take off four months out of the year and not grow anything. That makes sense. So preparing the soil for planting. A lot of people will amend the soil with fertilizer to begin. I know you mentioned your organic no-till. What do you do to the soil in order to prepare for planting? So first thing I take into account is what am, what am I planting? If I'm planting tomatoes in this three-foot wide bed, um, I'm going to put in different amendments than I'm going to do if I'm going to put in lettuce. So if I grow a lot of salad mix on my farm. So if I'm just doing salad mix, the most important thing is nitrogen. And the organic forms of nitrogen that I prefer to use on my farm is soybean meal. You can get a box of it for 20 bucks. I think there's five pounds in it. And a box lasts me, God, four or five months. So, I mean, that amendment's really cheap. And I just literally just sprinkle it all over the bed before I plant and then kind of rake it into the soil. So that's a big one. But the most important uh, amendment that I use is worm castings. And for those of you that don't know what worm castings are, they're worm shit, just worm poop. And it sounds gross, but it's not. Um, there's a guy down in Plantersville, Texas, down by Houston. And he's pretty much the smartest man alive when it comes to worm castings. Like, we all have our own hobby, and his hobby is worms and making the most nutritious worm castings there is in, in, in the world. Like, he has other worm castings tested. He'll buy them with his own money and test them just to make sure his are still higher grade than everyone else's. And he, he loves it. He's a wealth of knowledge, and I buy a 1,000 pounds from him twice a year. And what I do is usually a five-gallon bucket every 15 feet. So, like, uh, on a 50-foot bed, I'll put three, three-and-a-half, five-gallon buckets, which is about, I don't know, 60, 70 pounds worth of worm casting into that bed. And then just rake it in like I do the soybean mill. So the worm castings, if you're anywhere close to Houston, like Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico, it's worth the drive down there. You buy a thousand pound bag, big old tote sack. He puts it in the back of your truck with a with a tractor, and you drive off with it, and you go home and unload it however you want to unload it. But they're by far the best. I've I've actually done accidental tests <clears throat> when I plant tomatoes. Um, I dig a hole, of course, and then I put worm castings and some organic fertilizer in there. And I, sometimes I forget to put the worm castings in the hole. 
Well, two weeks later, I can go back and I can see, shit, I didn't put worm castings in that one because that tomato plant's two, two feet shorter than all my other tomato plants. I mean, it, there's a massive difference, and it's all because of the quality. And I've done every test that I can do by myself just to try it out, and every time they prove to be the best. And I really can't talk about them enough. Yeah, I use worm castings in my garden for my medicinal plants, and it makes a huge difference. Definitely makes a huge difference. It's got the microbes on there as well, which will help break down any other organic matter that you add into the medium. So, yeah, can't speak enough about worm castings, that's for sure. Now, are you starting these plants indoors and then letting them grow for a little while, maybe under a grow light, and then transferring them to your outdoor garden? Or are you just planting directly into your outdoor beds? No, I uh, I start indoors. I have a tough shed in my backyard because my wife um, was getting really pissed because I have so many lettuce plants and everything growing in my house. So I splurged and bought me a 10 by 10 tough shed and insulated it. And I've got a six, four foot wide, six foot tall uh, grow racks from Lowe's that has some LED lights uh, that I start everything from indoors. I mean, obviously root crops, carrots, beets, radishes, those get started direct seeded. Um, but most everything else is transplanted, lettuce, tomatoes, um, you know, some of the greens like red Russian carol or chard, I'll just direct sow into the ground. But probably 75% of my farm is uh, started in my tough shed in my backyard. And then, you know, depending on the date, how many days it is since I planted them, I uh, transplant them into my farm. I was going to ask what, how long do you let them grow indoors before you transplant to outdoors? Um, it, it switches back. It, it depends on the plant. You know, obviously tomatoes, I usually start, you know, around Christmas and I'll transplant March 1st because I like really big tomato plants. Um, so, you know, that's a good 12 weeks. Whereas lettuce is 21 to 24 days. Um, so it just depends on the crop. Uh, like I said, salad is usually 21 to 24 days, maybe 26, but anything over 26 tends to get too big. And when I transplant it, it goes into kind of a shock and I lose the bigger leaves anyway. So I actually lose time by letting the plants get bigger. Got it. Now, when you do plant them into your outdoor garden, forgot to ask, are you using any cover crops? Like some folks will use cover crops and grow along with their plants, or some folks will do cover crops between grows. Do you do any of that at all or, or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge cover crop fan. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Gabe Brown, but he's a regenerative farmer up in North Dakota or South Dakota. And he's got five principles for soil health. And I follow all five of those, you know, religiously um, just to try to increase my soil. And cover crop is, you know, so does two of the five things. It uh, always has a root in the ground. So during the winter... Like in my tomato, I call it my tomato tunnel. That's where I grow most of my tomatoes. Right now it's covered in a 13 seeded uh, winter uh, grass cover crop. It's about three or four inches high now. And then in the spring, around the end of February, March 1st, I'll, uh, I'll tarp it, kill it real good. And then I'll pull the, that dead grass back dig a hole, plant my tomato plants right into the, to the dead cover crop. And that cover crop acts as a mulch for uh, my tomatoes all summer, which helps with retained moisture. You know, my tomato plant roots will feed on the microbes from the cover crop plantings that still, the roots are still in the ground. They may be dead, but there's, there's still life down there eating and surviving and helping each other out. So I'm a huge, huge cover crop fan. Mulch layers. Do you use any of those? Um, yeah. So I can't use cover crops on my lettuce beds because the cover crop tends to not die perfectly. So when I go to harvest lettuce, I've got you know wheatgrass or hairy veg, whatever my cover crop was growing inside my lettuce, and it makes it so tedious to sit there and pick out every little thing. So instead of do, using a cover crop on my uh, lettuce beds, I use wood chips. There's a, there's a place two miles from my farm that sells a pickup load for 10 bucks. So I go down there quite often and get wood chips and put them everywhere. 
So I'll, I'll mulch, mulch with wood chip, especially during the summer, because it just keeps the ground cooler and moisture retention and all of that. There's so many benefits to mulching. So it sounds like you're getting everything just about locally, huh? Just everything is local. Except the worm castings. But yeah, everything else is, is local. And I mean, it's, my compost is three miles away. Wood chips is two miles away. My house is four miles away. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. That's the way to do it. So you've started your plants indoors. You've grown them to a certain point. You transfer them to your outdoor beds that are amended with the fertilizer that it needs for that particular type of plant. As the plant's growing, what type of organic inputs are you adding in throughout the grow? And when do you add them? So lettuce, I don't, the grains, I don't add anything after I, because they grow so fast. Like I'll transplant them in at 24, 25 days. And during the spring, fall, and summer, when the days are a little bit longer, you get more sunlight, I'll harvest at day 50. So they're literally in the ground three to four weeks before I harvest them. So lettuce isn't a big deal. Deer, uh, the other plants, the fruit-bearing plants, tomatoes, peppers, zucchini, stuff like that, I found this stuff at my local nursery here, and they get it from somewhere. I don't know. They don't make it, but it's got like bat guano, molasses. I mean, there's a list of like 20 different things that are completely organic that they figured out some combination to put together, and it comes in a gallon jug, and then you dilute, dilute that into a spray bottle. And about once every th- two to three weeks, I'll soak, I'll spend a few hours and go through seven or eight gallons of my, after I dilute it, seven or eight gallons, maybe half the jug and, and water, you know, deep water that stuff into the ground. And you can tell three to four days later, there's more blooms, they're healthier, they're greener, they're darker. Um, if they're really struggling, I'll do it once a week. And then maybe back off to every two to three weeks. I, I just go by observation. But that, it's a great amendment to have. I'm really lucky to fa- have found it. And it's really, I mean, it's $25 for a gallon. And I would probably use three gallons for the whole year. You mentioned watering. I wanted to ask you about that next. How do you go about watering? I mean, you have such a huge area that you have a garden on. What's your watering routine? Uh, it's drip, drip tape. Everything's on drip de- uh, drip tape from Drip Depot. Comes with a kit. Um, so what I, I have, you know, fourteen foot wide tunnels. So I have uh, a fifteen foot. I call it the main hose. A fifteen foot strip of main hose that goes across the length of the bed that has a water hose hook up to it. And each bed, depending on what I grow, like lettuce, I can get four rows of lettuce in a three foot bed. So I've got four drip lines that the lettuce is planted right next to every drip emitter, which is um, eight inches apart. So if there's a drip emitter, there's a lettuce plant right next to it. And at the end of the hose, out of the main hose, where the drip tape connects, has a, I don't know what you want to call it, a faucet nozzle that you can turn that specific line off or on. So if, I decide to grow something that's not every eight inches or I don't have four beds. I just turn that drip line off and turn the drip line on. If I'm growing tomatoes for, per se, I don't need four lines of water. If I've got one row of tomatoes and it's, just, it's all on drip. I mean, it's, you just turn it on. And the biggest thing is observation, knowing when to water and when not to water and you know, how long to water. And you know, other, other than just ob- observation, you just turn it on. You must be saving a ton of labor hours by having that automated watering system there. I imagine some people are listening to this and they're like, wow, it's a massive space. You must be spending all day long in your garden just managing your plants, whether it be feeding or watering or so on and so forth. How often do you spend in your garden each day? Um, four hours, four to five hours. Now, I could spend more, but I have a family. Um, and I don't think I even told you this. I'm actually a full-time teacher. Um. I found this farming thing seven years ago and I didn't know how it was going to go. I was like, you know what? I'm going to try it. Fell in love with it. Actually figured out I'm pretty good at it and it it makes pretty good money. But now I'm too close to retirement from teaching. So the way teachers work in Texas, you work 24, 25 years, and then you get a percentage of your salary for the rest of your life for the retirement. So I'm like literally eight years away. And then I get, $3,000 $3,000 a month for the rest of my life. So I'm not going to, you know, 
leave doing that when I'm this close. So I actually farm part time. I tell everybody I'm a full time farmer and a part time teacher. Cause that's the way I feel. Cause I do so much stuff at the farm and that I should do so much stuff at school for my farm. Like during lunch, I'm planting seed trays on my conference period. I'm on the phone talking to people or scheduling pickups or deliveries or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so I work from four thirty in the morning to seven o'clock in the morning at the farm. Then I go to school and then at night or on the weekends, I'll get in another, you know, a few hours here and there. It averages out to four to five hours a day. Yeah, I think I read in one of your other interviews, like in the caption or whatever, that you're a PE teacher. Yep, I teach uh, elementary PE, K through five. That's funny. My uh, brother-in-law is also a PE teacher, so. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, everybody's like, oh, that's the easiest job ever. And I said, come and spend eight hours with 300 screaming kids. I mean, yeah, I don't have to grade papers and listen, you know, do lesson plans too much, but. I have 300 screaming kids for eight hours a day. <laughs> so it's not all rainbows and sunshine. <laughs> uh, getting back onto plants, I, I did want to actually talk about pest prevention. Now you have such a large space that you're gardening on, and I can imagine that sometimes you have to deal with pests. What do you do to prevent pests from occurring? And have you ever had like any infestations that you had to battle that you can talk about? So... My arch, I have two arch nemesis, and if I was God for a day, I would destroy them forever, and they never walk the planet again. But they're um, this type of worm. It's actually a moth. It's what a moth is before it transforms into a moth. It's just a worm, and it gets down in the middle of your lettuce, and they like it there because it's usually moist, dry, you know, moist, warm, or cool during the summer. It's cool during the summer. And they just eat your plants from the, your lettuce from the inside out. And you don't know that it's there until half your lettuce is gone. And so during spring and fall, they're the worst. So during spring and fall, I'm literally digging pretty much in every lettuce plant looking for one. Because if there's one, three days later, there'll be thousands. So it's one of those things you, you want to stay on top of. And they have this, I hate using it. It's completely organic. You can spray it in your mouth. It tastes, I actually did it just to make sure. It tastes like crap, but, and it doesn't kill the, the worm. What it actually does is it makes the worm's mouth too sticky to open up and then it starves to death. So it's not like a pesticide. It, it's more like a glue, <laughs> but it's completely safe for people. So that's the only spray that I use. And then the other pest that I fight continuously with is hornworms uh, for tomato plants. You know, the, the big fat green worms that have the horns sticking out. They will destroy a tomato plant in two days. I mean, I had them real bad um, in the middle of October. I lost 30% of my tomatoes to hornworms. But the, the weather conditions were perfect um, for them. And the only way, you can't even spray anything for them. You literally have to just sit there and pick them off. Um, luckily, they're not that hard to find. You can get a black light, and they glow in the dark. So they have a very fluorescent color at night. So sometimes I take my kids out there and say, here's a dollar for every one that you find or something. <laughs> but, I mean, but those are the two that I have. Everything else I've learned, if you create spaces for... The pest predators, they take care of them, if that makes sense. So like Gabe Brown, I mentioned earlier, he said that he heard a, a scientist say there's 1,700 beneficial plants for every one pest. So I'm sorry, 1,700 beneficial insects for one pest. But you have to give them the environment to thrive in for them to go search. So that's why monocrop is so bad for farming, because there's no place for the good pest to live. So like in the middle of my bed, I might have a three foot raised box on top of my raised bed that's just got flowers in it. Salvia and marigolds and you know different stuff. And it looks completely insane because it's right in the middle of the zucchini. But the stuff that eats the squash bugs, which is usually a bad problem for people with you know zucchini and squash, they those good insects live in that flower, little group of flowers right there. You know, cover crops are the same way. Not mowing your cover crop gives those beneficial insects a home to live when you need them. So it's pretty much companion planting as well that you're utilizing. 
Uh, is there any other companion plants that you have besides the ones you just mentioned? It's not so, many, so much companion planting. It's what fits in that empty spot in the ground that I can grow and make money off of. While like when tomatoes get, my tomatoes get up to 10 feet tall. Like I, have you ever heard of uh, lean and lower? No, I haven't. It's when your tomato plants get so damn tall, you can't reach the top of them. So I trellis my tomato plants on one, one string straight up. And when they get so tall, you unravel some string at the top and you lower them and then they lean like this and then they start to grow up again. Well, all this space down here, there's nothing there because I prune that because to keep fungus and disease and stuff off the tomato plants. So I'll go in and I'll plant radishes or beets or lettuce or whatever I can think of that I know I can sell that I need that you know need to get in the ground. I'll plant underneath those tomato plants, for example. So it it doesn't hurt anything, but I don't know if it, if you call it companion planting, it's more like make money planting. Understood. Yeah. So let's say you've gone through the entire grow process. You didn't deal with any pests <laughs> that, that, that took away your crop. Oh, harvesting. Let's get into that. How do you go about harvesting and what do you typically get for yields? Um, it depends on what it is. Um, you know, salad, I sell in a Ziploc, one gallon Ziploc bag. It's not the most price, you know, I'm, I get DMs all the time. You're losing too much money buying Ziploc bags. You should use the Uline one gallon bags with the tie. But my customers like the Ziploc bags, you know, so I'll spend an extra 10 cents. And so anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. So like a Ziploc bag is six heads of lettuce and I sell it for five bucks. That just, just to give you an idea. Um, and, but I plant four rows every eight inches. So like I could get into the math and tell you, you know, real dork numbers, but just on basis I can, on a 50 foot bed, I'll make $500 every eight weeks on average, you know, during the summer, it's every six weeks during the fall and the winter, it's 10 to 12 weeks because stuff just doesn't grow as fast, but it's very easy to get five crops, five to six crops of lettuce out of one bed in a 12 month time period. And you can usually get about $500 for that bed. So you, know, you can do the math, uh, tomatoes, you know, it, it just depends on the crop. I could spend an hour telling you about it, but I, the easiest way I can tell you is once you're set up, it's so much profit margin is so high. You can't even imagine because you're not, I mean, the worm castings you pay for the seeds cheap as hell. Main, the main thing is your time. And I tell people all the time, I don't even know what to like, pay myself hourly wage because I would do it for free. Like if I never made another dime, I'd still farm just the way I do now, just because I love it. But the profit margins are insane when you start, when you, when you can quit buying stuff, like you don't have to buy another tunnel. You don't have to make more beds. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. Once you get your farm into a machine, it's probably 80% profit margin. That's incredible. I mean, it, it takes a while to get it to that point, but when you do, you, as long as you don't, do something stupid and or you know a tornado hits or something and screws everything up it's just a machine it's a well-oiled machine you do boom 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 wait three weeks and then do it all over again you know it's it's simple especially once you get that soil right like the first time you use the soil is one thing but year after year after year as that soil is getting better and better and better with all the microbes in there and the nutrition that's in there you got to be getting more, better and better crops each year. And, and, the, and the limits that I have that I put in, they don't get used every year. Like the soybean mill, I can dig down in there and I can see soybean mill from a year ago. Like it just has, it's a yellow color. So that's still there. You know, the worm castings are still there. So it's, it's all the, you know, if, if I put triple 10 fertilizer, which isn't organic and I never use it, but if I did, that should be gone in a month. Or less, and then and my soil's fried from all the fertile, from too much nitrogen and phosphorus and all that. So when you say it actually gets better, I'm building my soil legitimately every single year because I'm adding more castings, more soil milk, cover cropping. It, like it just gets better and the yields go up and it makes your plant stronger. It fights off disease and bugs and so it's more than just yield that you know that, that you're counting on. You're saving money by not having to buy more stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. So after you've grown the plant and harvested them, 
I mean, you talked, you talked a little bit about this in the beginning, but how do you go about selling the produce that you've grown? So I'm different from probably every other farmer that does what I do. I don't do farmer's markets. Um, I'm glad they're there for farmers, but I hate them. Like I want my, I, I have all my products sold before I harvest it. Um, I have a list actually that right there is my customer list. And that's my, that's what I go off of. If you look like I have week A and week B. So I have two weeks. Um, and week A, I deliver to this group of people. Week B, I deliver to this group of people. And they're like, why do you have two weeks? Because most people can't eat or don't want to eat all that produce in one week. And then boom, have it again on Sunday. You know, there's only so much zucchini you can eat during the summer. But if they eat it one week and then they do something else the next week, by Friday or Saturday that next week, they're like, oh, Mike's bringing me that ba- his basket tomorrow. I call it a basket. You know, and that basket has salad, zucchini, tomatoes, beets, green beans in it, you know. And so they're ready for it. So it's kind of like that old saying, keep them wanting more. And I have a few customers that I sell to every single week. I maybe – I think I got two people up there that I sell to every single week because they're vegetarians and I'm happy, you know, they're happy. They love it and it works out great. But if you ever start people out there, if you ever start at least consider doing two different weeks of customers just so, cause I always want a customer to say, I can't wait to get your stuff as opposed to, Oh crap, you're bringing me more stuff. You know, that's you want to be wanted, not like a hassle. How did you find the customers to begin with? And then how do you like do the communication with them? Is it through like an email list or is it all individual or, or what? It's a, there's not a whole lot of communication anymore because they know, like they know I'm going to drop it off at this time. Like I live in a subdivision in a little town outside of Dallas and there's 600 homes in my subdivision and it's, you know, a, a fairly well off community. And so they know on Sunday evening, I'm bringing in, bringing in their stuff. And I just drive around, drop off the baskets, you know, in my neighborhood. And then a lot of my customers are teachers. Um, teachers, anyone that's starting, that's thinking about doing this, teachers are the very best customer you could ever have if you're selling salad mix. Because they only get 30 minutes for lunch. They don't have time to heat anything up really. More than likely, they're trying to lose a few pounds or at least eat healthier. So salad's the best. Tell them they can have a fruit salad on Monday. They can have egg white salads on Tuesday, tuna salad on Wednesday, chicken salad on Thursday, and a nut salad on Friday. And it's five completely salads. You take it to them on Monday. It's literally the easiest sell in the world. And if, you know, teachers are great. Anywhere that there's a lot of people, hospitals, like I deliver to one hospital because there's like 10 nurses that buy from me. They're all in the, the I, I went blank, baby ward, pregnancy, going to have babies. They're all on that, that, shelf, that uh, floor. What's that called? Bud? Oh, my God. What is it? I'll put you on the spot now. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and nurses are always busy. You know, they're just like teachers. They got 30 minutes, if that. So they want something quick, healthy, fast, tasty. And I always harvest Sunday morning, I harvest Sunday night, I deliver, or Monday morning, I deliver. So it's literally 24 hours at old at the most, as opposed to you buy a salad at the grocery store and everyone's like, why is my salad going by? It's only day three. It's not day three. It's day 12. Because it was harvested in California, packaged in California, set on a warehouse before it got shipped to where you know to Dallas from California, set in the back of Walmart. Day eight or nine, it finally got on the shelf. Day nine or 10, you bought it. Day 12, it's earned. That's just the way our supply system works, which is completely stupid. Whereas if you buy mine, it was 24 hours old. Or not even mine. Anyone that grows local is 24 hours old. I've had people put it in the back of their fridge and their kids put stuff in front of it. And then they pull it out and it's been two weeks and they eat it. And it's as fresh as it was the day I gave it to them. The freshness is unmatched. I uh, locally here, I have a uh, green life produce and uh, yeah, getting it right from right after harvest. I'm getting it probably within 24 hours and it's delicious. Better than anything I've ever bought from a store. My teacher's told me I put crack in my uh, salad. 
they tell them that I'm a crack dealer and accident actually put crack in there because it's so addicting. <laughs> so I got to ask for your half acre garden that you're growing plants on, how many customers are you supplying? During the summer when stuff grows so much faster, um, I can do 40 a week pretty easy, you know, and that, that's 40, you know, baskets, um, in a basket, like I said, it's usually 15 to 20 bucks. And it's just to give people an idea of the math, I charge $5 for salad and 250 for everything else. So like tomatoes are 250, which is too cheap. It should be 350, but then I also charge 250 for beets, which is too much. But it averages out, and then it, it's just simple. And I've never had anyone complain about money. Most people actually, if I tell them this week is fifteen bucks, they usually just give me twenty. You know, because I also deliver to their door. I, when I started, I said, you know what? Amazon just bought Whole Foods. Amazon's going to be delivering stuff. Now they got Walmart. COVID hit. Walmart started delivering. So I was like, I have to deliver too. So I changed my focus around of marketing. And started marketing really close to my house or my school or my work. So literally everybody that I sell to, I can be there within, they're probably within a mile of my house or my school. It works really well that way. I can imagine it's super rewarding you know, supplying the folks around you with the food. Oh, it, it's, I've had people cry and not, not because it was so good, but because like one lady, her husband worked for True Green for 25 years and now has Parkinson's disease. And, you know, obviously nobody can prove it, but she swears it was because of working for True Green. And she doesn't want to feed her grandkids that come over, you know, stuff from the supermarket. Because even if it says organic at the supermarket, it's not. Or the organic label has been so watered down. That's why I'm not certified organic. They can kiss my ass. Like, I, I have absolutely no respect for that organic label anymore because it's, lobbyist has said, you know what, this, we can slide this in here. I mean, hydroponics or aquaponics is certified organic. Please tell me how that can be organic when all you use is chemicals to feed the plant. Like it, it doesn't make sense. So um, I, that's my soapbox. Like if you want to piss me off, bring up organic labeling and I'll, <laughs> I'll get a little fired up. But, but back to the whole thing was, the lady like literally cried. She's like, I've been looking for this for so long. I can't grow anything. And I just want to know I'm feeding my grandkids something because I don't want them to end up like my husband. And literally she's like, just got tears coming down her eyes. And that was super rewarding. And I've got people that be like, oh, you've got to try my salad. I'm the salad guy. Like if somebody meets me that knows of my salad, they're like, you're the salad guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the salad guy. <laughs> That's me, I guess. But yeah, it is, it's super rewarding. It's inspiring. And you know, what we just went over in this episode, how you do it, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy listening to your story and it in realize that it's possible. You know, I think a lot of people think about urban gardening and think about supplying people locally and they think that it's gonna cost a bunch of money to get started. They think it's gonna cost a, it's gonna be a ton of time doing this. And what you just explained there, that's not the case. You can get started cheaply. Now, courses, investments with the tunnel and stuff over time, but that'll pay for itself. It, it sounds very, very possible the way that you're doing it. And I'm really glad that you decided to come on here and share your story. I do have a, a few more questions for you. One of them is a question that you actually wanted me to ask you, which is why do you think urban farming is going to be important in the future? I mean, COVID taught us so much. And now with the war in, in, you know, overseas and basically everything's just falling apart. It's, it's some, I mean, the supply chain is such a joke. And the fact that we have to go to Whole Foods or Sprouts, and I don't know how many people do this, but I look and see where stuff comes from. And why in the hell we buy beets that are grown in Mexico? Um, as an example, because I just saw a label the other day that said made in Mexico on a beet blows my mind the amount of everyone's worried about the climate change why are we spending so much money on diesel and exhaust shipping beets from mexico or even california to texas i mean california is a whole nother podcast in itself the damn place is a desert we decided to make california the capital of ag in the united states and it's a freaking desert and now we're paying the price because there's no water 
the aquifers are running dry, it's quit raining, the lake mead is at its lowest level in history, and we get something like 80% of our lettuce from California. And it doesn't make sense. Um, so all that to say, urban ag checks the boxes of so many things. The customers are literally next door. And if you want to get in into details about other things like grocery stores, dying for local produce. And I don't mean Kroger, Tom Thumb, and Albertsons. Those places are impossible. But like organic food stores are starting to pop up everywhere. They would love to have an urban farm two miles down the road and be like, yeah, try my salad mix. I get it from Mike two miles down the road. It's just a great story. People love buying local. I mean, we know our mechanic. We know our doctor. We know the guy at Foot Locker that sells our shoes by name, but we don't know who put who grows the food that we put in our body and most of all our kids' body. That's just back ass words to me. So I really just want people to understand going forward in the next five years. And Warren Buffett said this, and he said, lawyers and doctors were the people that made the money in the past and they will continue to make the money. But moving forward, farmers will be included into that category in the future. And I I really believe that. I mean, Warren Buffett's not wrong about too many things, but you like the guy or not, he's not wrong very often. So, and I've seen it. I mean, I've lived it for six years now. And the amount of money you can make is ridiculous once you figure things out. And the best thing about figuring it out is there's YouTube. There is a guy named Curtis Stone, and I'll make this real quick. There's a guy named Curtis Stone. He's known as the urban farmer. And he's the one that made this type of farming popular. He's in Canada. He farms. And in Canada, in his town, they have it's an old town, so they have big yards, like third of an acre yards, quarter acre yards. And he farmed nine people's backyard along with his. The exact same way I'm doing mine. And he made $150,000 a year every year for like 10 years. So he started vlogging. And he vlogged every day for 365 days. Like a little 20 minute, this is what I'm doing today. And showed you how to do it. And that's where I learned about salad mix and you know greens and all that and the business side of it. So literally, you have a free course to learn how to learn, like learn how to grow commercially on YouTube. Now you have Instagram, and I will stay up 48 hours in a row helping people get started. Just send me a DM and say, how do I start? And I will reply back questions. I mean, I teach PE. I get bored. Here's three balls. Go play, and I'll DM you. Like, I don't, I don't mind. I, I, I live and breathe this stuff, and I want to help as many people get started as I can. That's really kind for you to do that. You might regret your decision after this was posted. <laughs> no, I, 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 I really won't. It's almost like paint it forward because I would not be where I am and have the happiness that I have if it wouldn't have been for Curtis starting his YouTube videos. And there's, you know, JM Fortier. You can look him up too if you're interested. Um, there's just a ton of people out there that's doing what I'm doing now on YouTube. I just don't have the time or as you figure it out, trying to set this up, the technology ability to figure it out. Yeah, it's not easy. But, uh, you know, what you're doing is is really great. So so thank you for that. One last thing would be, is there any other advice that you wanted to give folks looking to do the same thing as you? Just start and don't worry about killing everything. Like, I killed so much stuff. I look back and I'm like, God, I was an idiot. But I learned. I mean, experience is the greatest teacher. But again, luckily for you, you don't have to just learn from experience only. Like you can DM me, you can watch the YouTube videos, you can do all these other things to learn how to start. And there's so much money to be made. If you're 50 right now and hate your job and you're going to retire in two years, but you need a little extra income, this is the absolute perfect job for you. And you got to love growing stuff and getting your hands dirty, you know, but there's nothing better than waking up and, you know, going to your farm at seven o'clock in the morning and literally hearing the birds chirp and watch the sun come up. Half my post on Instagram was, is the sun coming up over the horizon. And I don't know why I keep posting it because it's literally the same pictures, but it's just something about it. This just, it just brings you back to, to the world that we live in as opposed to the cubicle and traffic and all that other crap. So let's wrap things up. How can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Um, Instagram is probably the best. It's Dallas Half Acre Farm. 
Um, that's the easy way. Shoot me a DM, comment, you know, hey, I DM'd you because sometimes if I, we don't follow each other, it goes to a separate account in my inbox and it, it's kind of a pain to find sometimes. So just let me know. Um, you can email me, mbell971 at Yahoo if you don't do Instagram. I'd give you my phone number, but my wife would get pretty pissed about that one. But after we email, I'll definitely give you my phone number. And um, so those are the three. I don't do YouTube yet. I want to. I just don't like I have the capability brain-wise. It's too full of plant shit to add in technology to. But uh, hopefully one day I'll be able to. But those are the three easiest ways to – or two easy ways to contact me. And, and, and don't hesitate to do it. Be like, hey, you said do this, so I'm doing it. I won't ever get mad. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll definitely have a link to your Instagram down in the YouTube description section below. And if you're listening in on one of the podcast platforms, just search for them. You'll find them. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode, and I'd love for you to tune into future episodes. Michael, once again, thanks for coming on. This has been awesome. Definitely a very uh, inspiring story. Some really good takeaways here. Uh, we learned how you do your process, how you sell your produce, and, and make a living from it, really. And um, you've really set people up for success in the future that they can take what you're doing and emulate it and supply their local community. So that's a big deal. I think it's a strong message. And once again, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for giving me the platform, man. I appreciate your time. Take care, everyone. Catch you in the next episode. Peace.